Let us pray using part of a prayer written by the Welsh poet Henry Vaughan 400 years ago. Let us pray. They are all gone into the world of light, and I alone sit lingering here. Their very memory is fair and bright, and my sad thoughts doth clear. O Father of eternal joy, and all created glories under thee, either disperse these mists which blot and fill my perspective still as they pass, or else remove me too, hence unto that hill where I shall need no glass. Amen. Please, please sit down. Before I start, I must say Henry Vaughan is one of my favorite poets, and he repays thorough repetition. Now, we have today to deal with the epistles called the pastorals. First and Second Timothy, and the oddly named Titus. No one knows who wrote these things. They are Pauline, and they often contain chunks, stuff of Paul, uh, but they were written much later by a Pauline uh, 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 scholar uh, steeped in Paul's theology. Uh, Second Timothy was written first, of course, and Titus was written second, and First Timothy was written last. They reflect a probable date in the second half of the first century, 140 to 150 AD. And all three bunched together are called the pastorals because they're written not to congregations or not to Philemon or Philemon, as we heard last time, uh, but to young clergy aspiring to be deacons, bishops, an office called widows and presbyteroi. Presbyteroi is a Greek word that simply means elder. And there was an office of the church uh, uh, in the first and second century called elders, deacons. Deacons went out and met the needs of uh, people uh, and widows uh, comforted other widows. It was an office in the church. And some elders later on became bishops. Now, we'll see as uh, shortly as we develop the theme why the Roman Catholic Church loves the pastorals and dates them in Paul's time. But we will see that there's nothing in the pastoral epistles, either in the language 
except for the quotes from, really are from Paul, that enable scholars to date them as early as 65. The author of all three epistles, and they have nothing to do with uh, Timothy and Titus, referred to by Luke in the Acts. The author, writing about 120, 110, 130, is obviously an elder, later to be called a bishop addressing younger church, clergy, and the writer has, assumes he has authority. He speaks as one with authority and is talking to what he believes to be a hierarchical church. Now, the early church was not hierarchical, and it is a, a, a continuing mystery when the church became organized according to bishops and archbishops and metropolitans and, and, and deacons and uh, other uh, such uh, uh, holy offices. Uh, the dating of the composition is most important for the earlier it is dated, the more structured the church became early. And the later it is dated, most Protestant, and we'd hear German Protestant uh, scholars, dated a hundred years later than uh, the priests of the Roman Catholic Church. By the way, priest is nothing but a Latin uh, corruption of the word presbyto or elder. The episcopate was well established by the time of the writing of the pastorals. Ignatius himself, Saint Ignatius, was martyred in Rome in 117, and the date of, writing, of the writing of the pastorals probably is, falls within the range of 110 and 140. The author isn't is a bishop, and he assumes he has the right to a bishop to uh, write younger clergy aspiring to be officers in a hierarchical church. The author uses Paul's name, he signs his name Paul, and he uses some of Paul's stuff, as we have seen. But the burden of the letters is sound doctrine, and it was written to a hierarchical church. There were many heresies about, and uh, 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 Paul's uh, name and Paul's doctrine were uh, solid doctrine and uh, they, uh, the, uh, uh, the pastorals are written to make sure that the younger clergy uh, are informed with sound doctrine. And it is written, all three of them, as if they're are hierarchical offices. Therefore, the dating, as I say, is important. There is no linguistic evidence that the pastorals were written in apostolic times. 
These three pastorals are advice given by uh, uh, an authority to younger people who want to be presbyteroi, elders, or bishops, or deacons, etc. The simplicity of the early church was lost by the time these epistles were written. By simplicity, I mean meeting in each other's homes, sharing a meal, sharing uh, burdens in society, uh, sending people out to uh, take care of the widow uh, Schwartz, uh, because everybody knew widow Schwartz. Uh, the b bishop of Ephesus writing these epistles and under the name of Paul, obviously is writing to a much larger and much more hierarchical church. Just when the house church became a cathedral and the simple meal became the uh, uh, sacred Eucharist uh, is lost in the mists of history. The best explanation of the date is given by a German scholar named Bauer, who speculates that the author of the pastorals wants so much to have an established church, he errs on the side of hierarchy. We know that we, uh, if, when we argue for a position, uh, which of us has not engaged in some exaggeration? And uh, the hierarchical nature of Bauer's interpretation is his zeal to give authority to the Bishop of Ephesus, whom he speculates is the true author. The purpose of the hierarchy in the pastorals, as I said, is to maintain sound doctrine and a priestly structure. The language reflects more structure than there really was until, say, 150 AD. The rest of the New Testament, all of it, assumes a non-hierarchical nature structure for the Christian church. But Rome is primary in the pastorals, and we first hear the phrase Catholic Church in the pastorals. We see that the date is terribly important for the doctrine of apostolic succession, who, which is the basis upon which some of our Christian brothers refuse to ordain women, for example. Jesus only had uh, male disciples. Well, <laughs> that, that's probably not true. And uh, 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 how can you ordain a woman as, uh, uh, who hasn't received the gift of uh, having hands laid on her head by hands that were laid on his head by hands that were laid on his head, going back to apostolic time. There is a period which both sides of this argument call the tunnel period, when no light is shined, shown, shined on uh, the facts of the matter, and uh, 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 
we continue. There is hope. There is hope. When I first became aware of the nature of the new Pope, Pope Francis, the papers and the religious journals, at least those that I see, regarded him as a conservative. Well, he is a conservative. <laughs> he believes that when, when Jesus says, blessed are the poor, he means blessed are the poor. Nothing else. Cast down the mighty from their seats. He believes that the gospel is intended to cast down the mighty from their seats. We could use a little gospel in this secular marketplace today when we regard the mighty in Washington. Anyway, the author of the pastorals writing perhaps in 140 A.D., is interested in, uh, mostly in uh, countering heresies and using the structure of the hierarchical church to uh, counter heresies. You remember Marcion, uh, Docetism, uh, mystical Hellenism. There are many religions hanging around in the second century, particularly in Asia, where the writer was uh, what Bauer calls a presbyteros, and the Roman Catholic Church calls a bishop. Um, there are many heresies hanging about the Mediterranean, Jewish, Christian, pagan, and variations of the same. We can all be thankful. We can all be thankful, no matter what our orientation, or no matter what our view of apostolic succession, hands laid on hands, going back to the original disciples. We can all be thankful for the Protestant Reformation because it emphasized the prophetic nature of the gospel. At its best, it emphasized the prophetic nature of the gospel, not the apostolic, priestly, uh, hierarchical uh, nature of the church as it was in the, sec in the middle of the second century. What happened to Protestantism? Well, many things. As Kierkegaard had it, when all are Christians, see, simply by being born into a so-called Christian society, Christianity does not exist. And uh, those in our country today who lobby for Christian prayers in the public arena uh, might uh, 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 gain a little uh, foothold by reading Kierkegaard. The pastoral's epistles faithfully reflect Paul's teaching about the risen Christ. Dying with Christ is to live with Christ. The pastoral's are inventive and speculative about the nature of the hierarchy of the church because the church was growing and needed a hierarchy 
to keep things in line. But the fundamental message of Paul is to die with Christ, is to live. Now, you can gain much insight from the Catholic tradition and the Protestant tradition in so far as the meaning of the faith. And uh, thank God, uh, we thank God for uh, the conservative Pope Francis, who is a conservative because he believes the Bible. Uh, uh, that's the kind of, that's my kind of conservative. He uh, believes that uh, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he hath anointed me to teach good tidings to the poor, the left out, those who otherwise have no shot at fulfillment in life. This man looks to be the real article. What does it mean? What does it mean to die with Christ is to live? It means, I think, faith in the risen Christ who cannot deny himself, according to Paul, frees us from sin. Now, good works, good works is mentioned five or six times in each of the so-called pastoral epistles. Second Timothy, was, which was written first, Titus, which was written second, and uh, First Timothy, which was written last. But the Pauline author, who must remain unknown to us, makes clear that Paul meant, and he meant, and the church, and the early church meant, and the hierarchical church meant, good works is loving and forgiving your neighbor, forgiving each other and yourself, and caring for the less fortunate. The Bible is clear. That's what the gospel is. The widow, the orphan, and as I say, casting down the mighty from their seats. It would be uh, interesting today to see some Protestant leader uh, try to cast down the mighty in Washington from their seats of power. I can think of some mighty whom I would like to cast down from their seats, namely, uh, well, I'm not supposed to say it, but the Republicans. Imagine a Republican elected to serve the common good in this country, in the Congress of the United States, stood up and said, as he voted against funding for food stamps, people don't want food stamps, they want to work. <laughs> well, if you're poor and black, and illiterate in this country, fat chance. That's what dying with Christ means. What do I mean by that? Who gets to define good works? Four or five or six times, good works are 
importuned by the writer of the these three epistles. But you don't get to decide what good works are. The Koch brothers think they're doing good works when they fund senators who voted against food stamps. If it were up to us, I mean you and me, to define good works, how botched of the, uh, a job we would make of the gospel. Good works are spelled out in the claims of justice of the Old Testament and the testimony of Jesus. Blessed are the poor, inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these, you have done it unto me. The Bible is clear. We don't get to define what good works are. We are recipients of a faith that enables us to risk boldly what the Bible says. And the Bible, I'm afraid, is pretty clear about what good works are. It's like justice. Justice is called, uh, defined by many things, but justice is not many things. Justice is one thing. It's the righteousness of God coming down by the power of the Holy Spirit, enabling sinners like you and me to make the crooked places straight and to everything is in the Bible, and I can put it no better than the Bible. You'd think that religion is a capitalist trick to get people's minds of the poor, the oppressed, the widow, the grieving, and put it squarely where it doesn't belong, namely in heaven. To die with Christ enables us to live with Christ. Christ is risen, and he defines what good works are. My friends, I don't know what's going to happen to me or to you when I die, but the Bible is clear, and if we die with Christ. We will live with Christ. And he will take care of all that, including in this life, giving us a clear idea of what good works are and enabling us with the power of the Holy Spirit to do them. Amen.